There's a legend in the Ukrainian Orthodox tradition that the medieval mosaics of St. Sophia Cathedral in Kiev are indestructible. Given the circumstances, I hope to God that legend is true. Let me explain why. The history of Ukraine is a winding, hard-fought, beautiful thing, but as I've discussed elsewhere on this channel, it can feel a little nebulous when we're looking at the borderlands of four or more empires and trying to construct one cohesive narrative while parts of Ukraine get carved off by Austria, Poland, Russia, the Ottomans, Russia again, but this time with hammers and sickles, Russia again, again, but this time they're weirdly inept about it, and especially in the context of the ongoing war, we risk falling into a narrative where things are always disastrous all of the time. So what we'll do today in Instead, zoom in squarely on the capital city to appreciate the remarkable splendor of Kiev, focusing in on one particularly emblematic site within not just the city, but all of Ukraine and the entire Eastern Orthodox world, St. Sophia Cathedral. As its legends of indestructibility imply, this church has been through the absolute ringer, but it, like Ukraine, is still standing. To see how magnificent of an accomplishment that is, Let's do some history. The history of Ukraine begins in the early medieval period with the migrations of Slavic people into the Dnieper Valley, but the history of Ukraine transforms in the moment when Prince Volodymyr of the Kievan Rus converted to Byzantine Orthodox Christianity. The tale has three main variants, the most storybooky being the one where Volodymyr wanted a new religion for his state, so he scoured the lands to find one to adopt, and was so astonished by the majesty of Constantinople and Hagia Sophia that he immediately buddied up with them. Of course, there's more to it than just that, but like, Orthodox churches are spectacular to behold, so it's not wrong. A more grounded tale focuses on Vlad's marriage to the Byzantine princess Anna Porfirogenita, which Emperor Basil II allowed on the condition that he stop being an uncouth pagan and get in the holy dunk tank. Never before had a Byzantine princess been married off to a barbarian, so for Volodymyr to succeed where even French and German Catholics had failed is wild. The third version, as told by Arab sources, might explain why Basil relented. When two Byzantine generals started making rebellion noises, the emperor pulled some religious and marital diplomacy to bring the Rus on side and get some of their warriors to help out. Taken all together, we see poor Basil in a bind, yet Volodymyr is genuinely enthusiastic about becoming part of the Byzantine Christian world. And that enthusiasm shows in his and Anna's thorough conversion efforts in the Rus, as well as the magnificent church they built as a commemoration. We got around 1011 and finished several years later during the reign of his son Yaroslav the Wise, Sofiski Sobor is named in honor of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Not literally a saint named Sophia, but the concept of holy wisdom. English translates it lazily as saint. Saint Sophia, but in name and style and intent, this was Kiev's Hagia Sophia. This centerpiece church was built by Byzantine masters as well as local Rus architects and masons, and it has several distinct features of Byzantine architecture. Most notably, the mixed brick and stone construction, cross and square layout, and emphasis on domes. But where Hagia Sophia and Constantinople is one ginormous dome, Saint Sophia has one high central dome, four smaller surrounding domes, and then eight more even smaller domes, all radiating out in a kind of pyramid shape. This 13 dome arrangement symbolizing Jesus and the Apostles was a brand new configuration unique to Kiev. There's a lot of theological geometry wound up in this. The idea of divinity emanating from God out into the world is physically represented by the arrangement and size of the domes. So the whole building is steeped in Byzantine symbolism, but Kiev was already interpreting the prompt in new ways, literally building their theology with their landmark cathedral. And the interior of the church might be even more spectacular, as it holds one of the biggest arrays of medieval Orthodox mosaics and frescoes and anywhere. There are standout mosaics of Christ Pantocrator and Panagia Oranta, but every surface of the church is covered in meticulously organized and beautifully rendered artwork. Saint Sophia employs some 177 shades of mosaic glass, dozens of blues and greens, and 25 different golds, a palette which, by our current knowledge, shouldn't have been possible with the materials available at the time. But nonetheless, there it is! Everything inside follows strict theological hierarchies, except for the surprising number of secular frescoes in the church. Saint Sophia shows scenes of Byzantine court life in the Hippodrome of Constantinople, as well as portraits of the prince's family. According to modern scholarship, this is all Prince Volodymyr's triumphal cycle, the story of his trip to Constantinople and the splendor of the Byzantine Empire, culminating in his marriage to Anna and building the Church of Our Lady, the first stone church post-conversion. As well as a handy canvas for the royal story, this fresco cycle unites the secular power of the Kievan Rus with the Orthodox culture they were now a part of, making this the first artistic depiction of their national history. Because Saint Sophia was a truly 
truly national space. In addition to the church, this space contained a library of Greek and Slavic writings, it received foreign diplomats, it hosted the Vicha assembly, and was the primary burial ground for the royal dead, with Prince Yaroslav the Wise most notably entombed in the church. This was a place for the religion, culture, and politics of the Kievan Rus all under one gorgeously domed roof. So in just this church, we can see how Volodymyr's baptism marks a conscious and permanent transfiguration of the Ukrainian identity into the fundamental form it would retain for the next thousand years. St. Sophia was a stone-built thesis statement of what kind of culture Prince Volodymyr wanted for his state and what the Ukrainian people agreed was worth doing. St. Sophia's completion in the decades after conversion affirmed this new identity and would remain a built monument to the moment Ukraine became Ukraine. However, its pathway to the modern world was not easy, as the church was first pillaged in 1169, not nice, by a rival Rus prince, and in 1240s the Mongols demolished Kiev, leaving St. Sophia as one of very few monuments still standing. Ransacked and ruined, Kiev became a shadow of its old self as political power and the seat of the church both scooted up to Moscow. Kiev suffered two more sacks in the 1400s and the church was abandoned for nearly a century, but after all that and a five-decade stint as a Catholic church, long story, St. Sophia became properly Orthodox again in 1633, a dozen odd years before Ukraine got independence as the Cossack Hetmanet. This period in the 16 and early 1700s saw a flurry of work to re-establish a national spirit, and the shape it took was Cossack Baroque. Innovating on their native architectural traditions with inspiration from the Baroque movement of Western Europe, the Cossacks built, restored, and expanded across Ukraine and in Kiev, and St. Sophia was a particular beneficiary of that artistic era. The Hetmans and church leaders built up a monastery complex around the church, with a monastic school and dining hall, housing, gates, and bell tower, first in wood and then all again in stone after a fire in 1697. But the most dramatic makeover went to the cathedral itself, with six new pear-shaped domes, a gilded central dome paid for by Hetman Ivan Mazepa, a new second floor along what was previously an outside gallery, and a plaster whitewash with green accenting on the roof and domes for an elegant bichrome look. These pear-shaped domes have since become iconic to the Orthodox style, and compared to goofy Candyland-looking cathedrals like St. Basil's, St. Sophia does this look well. Granted, the second floor and new domes fully overwrite the deliberate theology that defined the original look of the church, so pros and cons. Now, after centuries at the crossroads of great power conflict, some of the gravest danger to Ukraine's heritage came in the 1900s under the Soviets. As militant atheists, they fiercely suppressed Orthodox culture. The Dormition Cathedral at the Kiev Monastery of the Caves was confiscated and turned into an anti-religion museum, St. Michael's Golden Domed Monastery was fully blown up, and St. Sophia was next in line, only spared because of huge public outcry. It was still confiscated by the state in 1934, and every treasure not plastered onto the ceiling was plundered, but as it now wasn't in use, communist authorities did permit a formal study, with artwork getting restorations up through the 70s. It was only after Ukraine's independence in 1991 that St. Sophia once again became a celebrated site of Ukrainian heritage and an anchor point for their identity. One of many sites rejuvenated or fully rebuilt after independence, but a very important one. Yet, once again, that cultural treasure is under threat from Russian violence. I hope we never have to find out whether those mosaics truly are indestructible, but after 1,000 years, it's clear that the Ukrainian national spirit they represent sure as hell is. Thank you for watching. I'd like to thank Air Media Tech and Brave Voices for Ukraine for their help in putting this video and its fundraiser together. You can find a donation link below for Nova Ukraine to heal, rebuild, and empower the country and its people. I hope you'll consider donating. If you'd like to learn more about the war on the ground and the effect it's having on the people of Ukraine, you can also check out United24 Media, all linked below.